All right, welcome everybody. The first meeting of 2023. Happy New Year, everybody. Substitutions Happy. is the topic. Uh, and I think we're gonna just go ahead and get right into it. I'll pull my first video up. Everybody can see that, yes? First video of the night, someone give me an audible yes or no. Yes. Yes. Great. Yes, here we go. All right. Everybody, everybody watch that. Yeah. All right. So what, what happens? We've got, a, I'm going to go back. We've got a free throw. Free throw goes in. Mm -hmm. And if you all can see, there's a sub at the table, right? right. Now, first of all, this is a kind of a elementary question to ask, but where should that sub be sitting to come into the game? On the table. By rule, they should be where the X is on the floor. And where is the X supposed to be? In the center of the table. Half court. Division line. So does that mean, since this sub is not on that X, that we shouldn't let him come in? By rule, yes. <laughs> By rule, but let's use some common sense here. Are we going to say, oh, oh, wait, no. You walk to that X before you come in. Are we going to do that? No, no. no. I, I think the general rule of thumb, yes, there's an X, um, but it's supposed to make the players come to the table to report in as a sub, just so they don't just come running in or flying in. That's the purpose of the X. So if they're close to the X, then we're not going to split hairs on that. And I don't know. Has anyone ever split hairs on guys not going to the X? No. no. I hope not. All right. So that's just the first thing to notice. So there's a sub at the table. And our center official has his hand up. He was holding it up to chop the clock in, but the, the, the ball went in. And he sees there's a sub. So he blows his whistle. And I know we can't hear it now because I'm doing it slow. And look at him. Beckons in the sub, right? Mm -hmm. Which is great because it's a free throw. It's a dead ball. We have got uh, a new a new lead. The trail is going to be the new lead. The center is going to stay the center. And the lead is going to become the new trail. But I backed it up a bit. Look at the trail here. I don't know why he's not. Well, I understand he's watching the, the free throw and everything, but you know, right. so he's still, the trail, well, the trail doesn't watching. actually beckon him in, but he kind of stands there to like, oh, come on, you can come in, which is okay. Um, and the book actually says if, well, let me let me get out of here first. Maybe I should have said this first. In a three-person game, who beckons in the subs? Does anybody know the answer? Trail, trail of fishing. The trail yeah. official. So if the trail official is on the table side, they beckon the subs. If the trail official is on the opposite table, they beckon the subs in. It's the trail. Mm -hmm. Okay? So when you go from front court to the new front court, or you could say now it's a back court, front court situation, <clears throat> old trail, which would beckon in the subs, is going to become the new lead. Who doesn't beckon in the subs? Correct? Correct. Correct. So in that situation, the old trail could beckon the sub in, and then they give the responsibility to the center official. Everyone's got that, yes? Right. The other caveat, and I don't have a video for all of these little things, but the other caveat is the trail beckons in the subs unless the trail is administering a throw-in. So if the trail is administering a throw-in, even now, again, this is by the book, even if they're right next to the table, and they can just say, come on in, which is yep. enough for all of us to do. Technically, yep. the center brings the sub in because the lead is mm -hmm. administering a throw-in. We understand that? Yes. Yeah. All right. So don't get, we're not going to get bogged down on, oh, that guy did it wrong. And because we all probably do it wrong. I know I do. It's a hard thing to remember, especially in a game when we just want to get the subs in to play, right? So we're not going to. Be sticklers about that. Now let's go back to that game. 
So we'll go back to this spot after the free throw is made. The center beckons him in. Let's say the trail maybe did and passed it off to the center. The trail's now moving <clears throat> down to the new lead position. And that's why we pass it off. Because if the trail, old trail, new lead, sticks around the division line, when the sub comes in and out, then what do we have to do? Okay. We have to wait, right? For then that new lead to get down to a spot. So mm -hmm. why make everybody wait when your partner can just bring them in for you? That's what makes logical sense, yes? Mm -hmm. All right, so that's just a classic substitution video. Nothing wonky to see there. Uh, let's find similar to what we just saw. Look it up by Sam Ren. Brendan Beard. Brexton Beard indicator. Okay, there he goes. All right. Okay, from Santa. Going back. What did we just witness in that video? Remember, these are all videos on subs, so don't be looking for violations or fouls or this is mechanics primarily. I'm going to go back. Ball goes into the end line, over the end line, and out of bounds. Official calls and out of bounds. All right. We got subs at the table. He turned to look. <clears throat> First of all, we got subs at the table. And the blue player just runs on. I'm sure the horn went, Err. so that means he yep. goes on, right? No. 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 Right. We need to beckon them on. Now, mm -hmm. the horn sounds, and there's nothing preventing these subs from coming in. Just beckon them with the signal, even if they're already on the floor. Just give the signal. We don't need to make them go back and say, hey, I didn't let you in, because there's nothing that's we need to do to keep them from coming on. Now, if there's something that we need to do, then you would move them back um, out of the way so we can do what we need to do, whatever it may be, and then you beckon them on. But he didn't even look. He just ran on. He didn't even beckon. Maybe he said you can come into this player, but it doesn't look like he's doing anything. Now, the center official is doing what? He's beckoning them in. Yeah, he's beckoning beckoning in, them right. in. That's good. So why is the new lead, the old trail new lead, standing there? I don't know. I he's had that waiting. question in the beginning. Yeah, he's waiting to make sure all the subs are out, right? But he's giving that responsibility up to the center. So he doesn't have to worry about that. Now he's got to run all the way back down before we can start. And that's why we don't do it. Everyone see that? That's exactly what I was talking about correct. with the other video. That is correct. Well, what, what you are saying, Josh, is that that's why you always have, not always, many times in the game, you have the lead backing them in. Then you have the, uh, center back at them in and they're both got their stop you know, their, their hands out like this to stop and because because they don't know who's supposed to do it correct right so and that's a good point we need we need to know who's supposed to beckon the subs in so we don't have two guys holding hands up mm -hmm. and, you know if you have two hands okay fine i get it we can work through that but why have two guys worry about the subs coming in when you really only need one and everyone else can focus on the players and especially if it's a, a rough game or a physical game where we need to pay some extra attention during dead balls. We don't need two people focusing on subs. If it's a no nothing game and it's not physical or they're all, you know, choir boys, I suppose it's a little different, but. Hey, Josh, yeah. Rick, Watson, Rick, Rick Watson out of Fredericksburg, Virginia. How you doing? <clears throat> Welcome. Hey, um, a lot of that stuff could be prevented during, during the pregame, pregame with that, with that, uh, with, with substitution and um, all that good stuff. So uh, as to who's gonna be breaking the subs in, who's gonna be looking out for the sub transition, also front court and also transitioning from front court, to, oh, sorry, from back court to front court. Now I would say, yes, absolutely. Um, I would say, don't spend a ton of time in your pregame on who's no. gonna bring subs in, <laughs> right? 
You do want to mention, hey guys, just remember for subs, Trail brings them in. If the Trail's got to go down, become the new lead, then the center can bring them in. That pretty much covers all scenarios. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not all, but most of the scenarios are covered by that. It's just a good reminder. I agree. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me show my next video. Everybody follow that one. Yeah, that was good directions. So we have a, a foul. Clear control. They go to report control. the foul. Clear control. Here's the first thing that I don't like. What don't we like about this so far? Well, he ran across the, um, I hope he didn't run, well, he ran across the key. It's coming running down the court. Um, well, he went around the kids. Yeah. Oh, I got that right. All the kids court. are to the left. Yeah. And then the few kids to the right are going the other way. So he ran around the kids. But look okay. at the table. Coach is yeah, there. Coach right there. Coach he's right, right at the table. Now, he's not causing any harm. I get that. But he's not supposed to be there. So the first thing that this official does is he says to the coach, hey, go back over there. Right? Mm -hmm. okay so that's handled fine coach goes over there then the, the sub tries to come in onto the floor so the official instructs him to stay there go back mm -hmm. so far so good yes mm -hmm. so the kid oh he listens okay i gotta go back and stands there but now what's happening yeah two 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 players standing up do you see so where the good. scorer is yeah, they're in the they're they're in the way of the official trying to present the foul. <laughs> he's at the X. That is fantastic, right at the X. But he's standing in the way of the score, so the scorer can't see what the official is trying to do. So the official recognizes this. We don't want to report through a player, right? So he says, "Hey, sit down," which he does. So far, so good. They're listening. They're taking notice of what's going on. Do we have to have the other kid sit down who's on the floor, who's coming no. out? No, you no. move him out the way. No, but he's just, he's a player. He's a player. I'm not going to make him sit down. And no. he, for the most part, is out of the way because the scorer can now see the official. Do we agree? Right. No. All right. So he reports. Looks like he goes around the, the player a little bit. Reports. Does his team control fouling correctly? And then brings brings the sub in beckons him in doesn't say okay just now we're good to go he actually beckon, beckons him in because we have to beckon for them to come on especially if you are telling players to stay back or to hold on when you're done you've got to beckon them on because they're waiting you they're doing what you told them you don't they don't want to guess anymore usually you're like oh he's done now they don't know when we're done you have to make sure we tell them you can come on now Gosh, were you the official in that? It looked like you. You always yeah. got to call me out. No, I'm just asking. Yes, that was me. Uh, I started to say that it looked like you. I could tell the way his signals were. I've seen it before. So uh, if they're trying to come on, hold them on. Tell them to go back if you have to. Make them sit down. Sit down. If they're in your way, don't. Try and report around or still look. Yep, you're on already. Take care of your business of the kids before you take care of your business of reporting. I got a, I got a question for you, Josh. Yeah, what's, okay. your, what's your uh, comment or view on talking to your fellow officials at the table and telling them not to hit the horn before the game and talk to them and say, don't hit the horn. Don't, don't bring the subs in. Let us bring the subs in. Do you ever do that? Talk to the table. Um, I, I don't um, for the most part, because it's not usually an issue. If you find out 
after you're in the game for a little bit that they're hitting the horn at the wrong time or they're doing it incessantly or whatever it may be, you can go over and talk to them. But I'm not going to start the game telling and the table all these things that they have to do. Because once you start that, especially the ones who know what they're doing, some of them are going to be like, what, who's this guy? You know what I'm saying? So I, I kind of just assume they're going to do a great job unless the maybe the sophomore officials that came off said, hey, we had a hard time with the clock keeper. We had a hard time with the score. Okay, now you can use that information and proactively go to the table and maybe start a, a rapport. But otherwise, I'm going to go into the game. I'm going to assume that they're good. We're not going to have any problems. And then if it does arise, I'll address it. Does that help what you were uh, getting at? Yeah. All right. Let's look at this video. Okay, now, did you hear the whistle? I'm going to play it again, and I want you to, if you don't have your sound up, turn your sound up so you can hear the, the sound, where the ball is, when the whistle blows, and kind of watch. And then over by the table, you'll see a sub coming onto the floor. And look at the coach on the end line. <laughs> look at the coach on the end line. I'm going to go back here. We pass the ball into the free thrower. Okay. Look at the table. That's a sub. That is not a player on the floor. That is a sub. Whistle blows about here. And then he shoots the free throw. And it goes in. What do we do? Ignore it. That was the defense, wasn't it? You can't ignore a whistle, can you? No. No. So as soon as he blows the whistle here, is he allowed to finish that shot and score it? No. No. Not by rule. And it looks like it was the first of two because nobody moved whatsoever. Maybe it was the last one and they're not moving because of the whistle. And the coach is like, what is going on? You just blew the whistle. My kid, you know, put the ball in. What Now what's going to happen? So you see the official walking this way. And I, it's clipped right there. But what happened was, let's go back. The sub came onto the floor. Player has the ball for a free throw. So is it a live or a dead ball? Live. Dead ball, dead ball, dead no, ball, dead ball. ball. Right time. here, it's live yeah, ball, correct? Right. Correct. Right all right, so once there's a live ball and then the sub enters the court without being beckoned, what do we have? Illegal, illegal substitution. Yeah, but technical. 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 I was going to say that. It was right. a it's an it illegal was a substitution, which is a technical foul on whom? Is it a team technical, a player technical, a coach technical direct to the coach? Is it just an indirect? Does it go to the team count? Is there no a, technical at all? Can we correct a without a technical? That's a bench technical. Is it a bench technical? Yeah, it could possibly be. Bench or team. No, no, it's team. a bench technical indirect to the coach. But he came onto the floor. So isn't a player that comes onto the floor a player? He's still bench personnel until he's beckoned. <laughs> When does bench person, when does a substitute, not bench person, when does a substitute become a player? He steps on the court. When he's beckoned onto the court. When by he's a yeah, when he's beckoned on. A substitute becomes a player when he or she legally enters the court. Nothing about beckoning when they legally enter the court. If entry is not legal. The substitute becomes a player when the ball becomes live. A player becomes bench personnel after their, we don't need to know about that, about their, their fifth foul. Okay, so did 
One, did they legally enter the court? No. Well, yes, yeah, by, by, by your rule. Okay. No. Now, here's the other caveat. Did the ball become live when they were on the court? Yeah. Yes. Yes. The ball yes. was already live. So now yes. what do we do? I'm going to assume since it's not um, on the screen that the sub left the floor. I'm going to, the, the player that was being substituted out. All right. If we go to rule 10, section three, which is substitute technical. It says it is a technical foul when a substitute enters the court without being beckoned by an official. Right? Which is what yeah. he did. Do we agree? Yes. So yeah. regardless of live ball, dead ball, this sub was beckoned onto the court, was not beckoned on the court and came onto the court during a live ball. So it's a substitute technical foul, correct? Correct. It is not a bench, and there's a difference. It is a substitute technical foul. Because the player took. So you're they're obviously going to get two free throws, right? Got to clear the lane. We'll clear the lane. They'll get two free throws. They're going to finish this. They're going to finish this kid's free throws from the foul. Yes, because we do it in the order, the order they occur. Yes. Are we going to count that bucket he just scored? No, because he had a whistle before the ball was uh, released. As soon as he blew the whistle, the ball became dead. So he's going to get two shots, and then we're going to shoot the technical fouls, right? And then White will get the ball at the division line. Correct. <clears throat> Correct. Mm -hmm. What happened to his second shot? Uh, his first shot doesn't count, so he's going to get two shots. And then the coach can determine okay. choose technical. Okay, Joshua, go go over that again because uh, you just totally confused me here. Okay, so, so you say you're telling me he's, he's you're not going to count the one that he hit. That's not going to count because the official blew his whistle. Okay, when the player had the ball, as soon as the whistle is blown, the ball becomes dead. Right. Okay. Got it. Got it. Right. Okay. Now. I got it. So my, Was that my, the correct move to blow the whistle on that situation? Right, right when that so, player enters the court. So if you witness this player come onto the court and you see that the free thrower has the ball, I would hold my whistle because you're taking away this advantage of shooting the free throw. Right? Hold your right whistle, up. wait to see what happens, then blow your whistle after and then sort out the rest. Yes. Then you don't have one shot on the foul. Right. Administer two free, two technicals. Correct. And you would still, you can still assess the technical for the sub coming in when they weren't supposed to. Right. But you don't right. disadvantage that free throw shooter. Now what right. if he misses the next one? It's almost like, Correct. sorry, coach. Yeah. Well, hey, Josh, not to throw a, a wrench into it, but if you don't blow your whistle, like you're saying, you hold your whistle. And what what if what if after you hold your whistle, the kid realizes he's not on the he shouldn't come in, and he runs and he goes back off. Too late. Too late. Did you witness the kid come onto the floor? Yeah. yeah. So it's been discovered you're you're withholding your whistle, kind of like on a technical foul. If a coach is right. yelling and screaming, you suck, you're terrible, and the other team is on a fast break. We're supposed to hold our whistle until that fast break is over before we assess a technical foul on that coach. Correct. So it's just common sense um, mm -hmm. but to let the team who has the advantage shooting the free throw to finish that play before we assess the technical foul. Does that make any sense? Did I clear any of that up or did I just make it worse? That makes sense. No, yeah, it makes good sense. I got it. A substitute foul. A substitute technical foul is given to the substitute. So it is a player technical sure. foul to whatever number that is. It does not go direct to the coach because he is not bench personnel. He's a substitute. Does that make sense? So the coach can still stand 
because the sub came on. He's not controlling his bench. The sub is there. Does that, does that make any sense? Yes. It's semantics, I realize, but that's why they define what a substitute is. They define what bench personnel is. They define what a player is. Because when these little things happen, we have to know what was he at the time of the infraction. So to, so to support your point, if the substitute were kneeling next to the table, right, and then inadvertently walks onto the court as it appears he did, that supports your case here. That supports your case. And you could say he came on on bucket. Now, let's throw this into it. The kid came in and was like, oh, crap, I'm not supposed to be coming in yet, and comes back out. Do yeah. we think we can ignore that? Was there any advantage gained by him coming onto the floor a foot? Did you see him hardly came on? Is that something we could maybe withhold our whistle? And he went back out. All oh, the kid was just, okay. He didn't run on during live <laughs> play. I know it was a live ball. He didn't run on when the, when the ball was going on. If it happens during a dead ball and we see it, don't we tell them to go back, wait for us? So it's not. Yeah, that, that, that was my point. So it's something where I think we could withhold our whistle and see that the kid didn't. Now, if he comes on and he goes and he gets ready to, you know, participate, that's one thing. But he came on two, three steps and went, oh, I got to go back. If we hold our whistle and just wait, but the kid has a, the free throw. It didn't interfere with that, didn't distract him. What do you guys think? I, yes or no? Because by no. rule, it's a technical foul. By rule. No. But say, as, long, as long as you don't have any distraction of the free thrower, you should be able to hold your whistle there. I, I agree. I think preventatively, we can do nothing. And nobody, one, is going to be the wiser. Not that we're trying to be sneaky out there. But it didn't affect one iota of the game. Right? <laughs> In fact, in fact, if you're standing as the trail by the division line and you see him come on, you could be like, hey, get off. You got to get off. Wouldn't we proactively try and do that? Yep. Yes. I think so. Now, does that also count as one of the uh, team files? So it's a team file. It's a player file. It's a team file. Yep. Okay. But it's not an indirect to the coach. All right. Let's go to the next video. Oh. Big block by Gerard Starr. Well done. And the floor now he has to come out. <clears throat> he come out, check on. <clears throat> he uh, called the foul on number. The COVID game, as you can see. He's Josh mm -hmm. Harris. He's not on the floor. Now he's changed it to 22. Star was a very nice block. Everyone follow what's happening. Right. So let's go back. What happens here? Play comes down. There's a foul. We, we call the foul. Good. Kid goes down kind of hard. The official kind of stays there to make sure he's okay. Looks like he is. He's getting helped up. Great. So he goes to report. As he's reporting, I don't know why the coach came out right away, but the coach came out. Now, if the coach isn't backing down to the floor, by rule, as the rule is written, what is that? Direct technical foul on the coach. Technical yeah, foul, technical right foul. by rule, technical foul. And that is direct. And that's a direct. However, that is meant to keep coaches from coming out to yell and scream or do something else to cause havoc. What is this this coach doing? Coming out because he's an injured player. He thinks his player is injured. I think in this actual clip, there was some blood. He's coming out. As soon as you see that coach come onto the floor, you beckon him out. Hey, coach, come on out. Whether you think you need him or not, just to cover your rear end, like Ken was talking about with the other player, I don't know, I told him to come out. Yes, he was already on the floor, but it just, let's do that. And so nobody's going to say, well, he shouldn't have come out. But now that he is out to check on his player, what can happen or must happen? That player has to come out. The player has to come out. 
Unless what? Unless the coach takes a timeout. Unless he's ready to play within a minute. He, the coach may call a timeout. <laughs> and if he's ready to go when the timeout is over, so if it's a 30 second timeout, he has to be ready after that 30 seconds. Sure. If it's a full timeout, he has to be ready after a minute, then he can stay in the game. But if he calls a timeout and he's not ready after that final horn, doesn't matter. He's still charged the timeout and the kid has to stay out. Mm -hmm. Right? That's only when there's Correct. an injury or blood situation mm -hmm. where the, the coach comes out or you request the player, even if the coach doesn't come out and you request the player to come out because of blood, mm -hmm. they can always they always have the option to call a timeout to keep them in. Mm -hmm. This coach did not. And I, I mentioned that, by the way, because we as officials – we need to instruct these coaches that option because a lot of these coaches don't know that they can keep their player in. This is a fourth quarter, 342. It's a 20-point game, so it makes no difference in this game. But if it's a two-point game with 30 seconds left, he might want that player in the game, right? Because he's a he's a playmaker. Mm -hmm. So we, may, we need to make sure they know that that is an option. Now, the other side of that, Josh, because I had that come up in the game tonight, if that player comes out, they cannot come back in until after you have a live ball. Oh, correct. Until after the, the clock ticks off at least a tenth of a second. Yep. <clears throat> now, let's say it's 342 now. You're not going to say, well, a tenth came off. You need one tick of the clock. So here it would have to be one second at least. You'd have to move to the next digit so you know that time had started. If it was you know, 20.2, it would just need to be a tenth of a second. You see that the clock has moved. So one tick of the clock, and then they can come back in. Correct. A lot of coaches don't know that. So now let's take the scenario because this is a shooting foul, and this player has to come out. So who can they elect? And it's due to blood. The kid is bleeding. Who can they elect to shoot the free throws? Substitute. A legal, a legal substitute. Does the coach get to pick of the other team? No, no, no. In high school and college has a few different rules when it comes to blood, but in high school, when a player is removed because of blood or injury, the substitute who replaces him uh, will take the free throws. Throws, Right. It has to be the substitute. And yes, it has to be a legal substitute. Um, you can't pull someone who's been disqualified. Um, or, or I guess that's the only one I can think of. Now, since we know that 10's coming into the game, he shoots the free throws, right? So he goes out to shoot. But what happens? He just came on the floor. He can't he just run on the floor like that, can yeah. he? No, he has well, a report. He... I thought you all said that was a technical foul if they come onto the floor without being beckoned. Yeah, you got to tee that guy up, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a different lifetime, you know, back in the COVID days. <laughs> but even in today's days, if that player comes on during a dead ball, nothing's going on, they've entered improperly, you simply correct the situation and make them enter properly, which is what they do. Hey, ball. go back and report. He reports, great, you're good to go, and then he goes in. Actually, it looks like the coach told him to go to the table. Maybe. You could very well be right. Like, Johnny, what are you doing? All right. So the point of that video is, one, if there's blood or injury where they are, are um, directed to leave the game, their sub has to take the free throws unless they use that timeout option that they have. When that sub comes in, they still have to report, even though nobody else is coming in. Everyone knows they're subbing. We've been waiting for three minutes because we're getting the player off. They still have to go to report. what I said a couple videos ago about talking to the players, the substitutions to come in. We got a foul again, which we get. The official walks through the players a little bit. That's okay. Those kids are running in front of them. I would probably stop and wait for those kids to run. 
because you don't want to report through these players, right? As they're running by you, you want to be unobstructed when you report to the table, but the sub starts to come in and the official says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Look at the, look at the new, looks like it's going to be the new center to the right, bottom of the screen. He's also saying, hold on, hold on. You can't come in. Hold on. Right? That's great. And the kid listened. We reported. I would have probably had him sit down, but maybe the score is off to the left. And then he just walked off. Right? And look at the substitute. He's standing there and he's waiting. He doesn't want to come on because he's been told that he's got to stay over there. So the new center comes over and says, you can come on. Come on, you're in. All right? It doesn't matter. In my opinion, it doesn't matter whether the guy reporting it says to hold and wait or beckons them in or after or whatever. As long as somebody does, we still have to let them know to come in, especially with those kids who are being good kids and waiting and listening because we told them to stop. All right, that one wasn't rocket science. That was kind of a goofy rotation, though. Why? Why would they just not have him stay table side? Right, hold on, let me look and see. Uh, this, this. Okay, so we have a foul. Opposite table. Throwing's going to go opposite table, even though he didn't. That's another thing. Let's just point everything out on this play. Then you call the foul. Great, but you still have to point where the throwing's going to be. So everyone can get ready to go. Now, this one was obvious. They go over there. He's coming into the foul reporting area. He's up a little farther than he needs to be, but reporting. And he should go right back because when you have a foul in the front court from the center or from the trail, you go back to your original position. Looks like he came over, was maybe going to stay center, but he doesn't actually stay center, and he sees that, oh, okay, the open position is back where I was. So it's not a weird rotation. It just was done kind of It was done kind of weirdly. Does that make sense? It's like you said, he should have reported, at like right about half court, waited for the players to clear, report, and then go down the lead. He right. like, And that foul reporting is all the way to the, the center of the court. Right. So you don't have to, especially on one where you know you're going to go back, you're going to come and go back. Just get into the box right at the division line. Wait. If there's players moving on, just stand there and wait. They'll wait for you. They don't need to rush through it. Report and then go back to your position. I think in this clip, though, he thought he was going to go to center and that was going to be a spot. And when he came over, he saw his partner was still standing there and turned around and said, oh, yeah, I got to go back and then just walk. Right. Over. So it looked a little wonky, but it ended up being a perfect rotation or they didn't rotate at all actually, but so that's exactly what should happen. Let's do this one. This is a long clip. What do you think's going on here? Blood. Blood on his jersey. Concussion. Yeah, it looks like blood. Probably blood. He came in, saw some blood on the shorts or the shirt or something. Balls him over, talks to the coach. Ask some more he's going afterwards if they want to get some beers. Just kidding. That's not what he said. Waiting around, looking at the trainer, cleaning the, the shorts, still waiting. Didn't start a little dance there. Comes back and like, okay, you're ready to go. You cleaned it. We're good to go. And we, we continue on. Is that the correct procedure? Absolutely not. Even if it only took five seconds. And I know now you would say common sense, this, 
even though it only takes it once you've noticed blood and you direct that player to come out to fix the blood issue, he yeah, must be up, replaced. Man. Unless right. what? You take a timeout. Take a timeout. No, I didn't see them report any timeout. Um, and you could say, well, maybe they said he's taking a timeout, mark it off the book. But if that's the case, you need to announce it and report it because the other team then is allowed to use that time as a timeout. So I don't think that's what happened, but if it does, report it and make it official. That way you know when the horn goes off that it has to be done and fixed by them. That took you a long time, and you just delayed everybody to have it fixed. Blood, out, and they don't come back in um, right. until it's resolved and their replacement shoots the free throws. Mm -hmm. Right? Correct. I play that clip because – all right. Did you feel a little uncomfortable that it kept going and going and going and going? It took a long time. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to wait for that. The fans don't want to wait for it. The other team doesn't want to wait for it. Yeah, sure, that team wants to wait for it. Maybe that was their star player, their best free throw shooter. But we want to make sure that he comes out of the game or give him his options. How about this one? Right now, very similar to that other play. And yes, that official is me again, Dennis, if you want to call it out. Yeah. <laughs> and this one handled basically the same way, different view, but I just want to point one thing out. Official comes over after the foul. The official already sees the player starting to come onto the floor, right? Which we know can't happen. So he tells him to go back. And then some of them are standing. So he says, sit down. But that kid doesn't sit down. Now you are the official. You're not just the adult out there. You are the official. You are in charge. If you tell them to sit down and they don't, I would wait until they sit down. Continue to tell them like I did here. Because you don't want them to control the game. You are in control. And it may seem like a small thing. Like, well, what's the big deal? The big deal is that small detail speaks very loudly as into who's in control of this game, who dictates what happens, you or me. If I tell you to sit down and you don't, well, you just won a battle that you think now the next battle, which might be a little bit bigger, you're also going to be able to win and test you as an official of what you're going to allow. So this one, very easy. Wait, I told you to sit down. You don't want to. I'm going to tell you again. I'm going to wait. Does that make sense? And then you let them I all in and you're can happy and you can even joke. Sometimes I'll joke with them. I don't know, like a spur of the, this is what I think. And because some of those kids need a little emotional release. You know, some of those games, they're so intense. And even if it's not a great game, but you can see like they're going to rip each other's heads off. Try to get a little zing in there. All right. What do you guys think? I know I didn't get every little situation in there, but was it somewhat helpful? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Me so the too. next subs, the next subs you guys have illegally, you're mm. all over it, right? Yeah. Whacking them all. <laughs> <laughs> we can be proactive on most of it. <laughs> um, let me pull up. I didn't get this ready. Sorry. Let me pull up um, our schedule for the next meeting. Well, you got a second. I don't know if you covered it before I got here, but so many uh, substitution areas, uh, the table, they love putting it as close to the court as possible, even though they got 10 feet behind them and the people sitting behind them. Yeah. So that's kind of my pet peeve. Whenever I show up, I'm always asking table personnel, back your table up. That way we have like three to four feet. You mean where the sub goes to the X to come in? Yes, because <laughs> they're always like lying with a foot on the line. And I feel like I'm going to trip or 
crash into them every time. Okay, so turn it. my take on that is, and we talked about it slightly about the X because that's where they're supposed to report. But the intent of that X, the purpose that rule was created is they didn't want kids just coming to the side of the table or coming in from the bench and just coming in without reporting to the table. That's the whole purpose. The score needs to know that they're coming in. I'm not going to be a stickler that they're not on that X. If they're at the end of the table, fine. I'm going to witness then if they reported in, I'm going to make sure that they did report. And the first one or two times, I might even say the score, did he report? Is he good? And most of the scores say, yeah, yeah, we got him. He's good. He's all right. A lot of them will say, thank you very much. These kids don't ever report to us and nobody ever says anything. So mm. it's okay for you to say, go back. But if there's not enough room, I'm okay with them being on the side of the table to not interfere. If you are able to get that table to move back, great. That's wonderful. <laughs> most of the gyms I've worked in, that table is set and it's not moving. Or maybe I've never tried, I guess, but most of it's there. So I work with what we're given. Well, a lot of your older uh, elementary schools or middle schools, you can't move that table. Right. There, and it's like no fixed room. to the bleachers or to the floor or whatever it may be. Um, or now they've, they've got those ones that've got the, like the display that goes. And so it's got to be plugged in and the plug's right there and they can't move it. So you can be a little forgiving as to where the kid is, um, but still make sure they report to, to the table. Okay. Hey, Josh. Yeah. Um, last week, I wasn't involved in it, but uh, over at uh, Crystal Lake Central High School, did you hear what happened over there? With the kid punching the other kid? Yeah, I saw the video of it. Yeah, when they were, they were in line, shaking hands, and you could see from the corner of your eye, the officials looked like they left the court. You couldn't see them behind the bleaches. They were probably going in the locker room. All of a sudden, the guy from Crystal Lake Central looks at this kid and punches him, and he backs up. And he punches him again, and the kid runs to the corner, and the Crystal Lake Central kid chases him, and then all these people are running on the courts. <laughs> was that after the game? You guys want to yes, see it? it I'm gonna, was, I'm gonna it was it after the game. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, let me see that. Yeah. It's going to happen um, lower bottom left, okay? I think the number is 50. We're almost Next off the court. Legacy club. Ping pong out of the studio now and probably off the court visual confines now. Yeah, they're gone. Ready. <laughs> that crazy? Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's nuts. He gets to, he gets to a mid line. You could see he was just waiting. He gets to him, pushes him out. Look now, believe it or not, I have a friend who spoke to the kid who got punched. He said, that was you. He's like, what, did, what happened? He's like, well, as soon as he punched me, he's like, I just ran. Look at him. He's like, oh, I'm out of here. <laughs> Which for that kid is smart. You don't want to start. Now he can't be blamed for fighting. He did nothing. He turned and he ran away. The other so kid, I was told, got taken out of the gym in handcuffs. Good, good. Ooh. And he should have. Yeah. We all agree he should have because that's unacceptable. Now, officials, you've left the visual confines. Yeah, they were gone. And those officials, yeah. I spoke to two of them, said the AD was with them, showing them to the their room. Mm -hmm. When someone's like, oh, there's a, there's a fight going on out here. And so the officials are like, go handle that. We can get into our own room. Don't worry about us. But don't, as officials, go back out there and try and do something because you are outside the visual confines. Your job is over. Yep. Okay. Correct. All right. That is correct. Yeah. If you are in the visual confines, now you are responsible. And that game is, let's say, it was won by two points. And that team that punched was, was the one who was winning by two points. You can assess a technical file. Mm -hmm. You can shoot the free throws. Even if maybe maybe the game was five points and you don't shoot the free throws because it's not going to affect the outcome of the game, you still assess that kid a flagrant technical foul and eject mm -hmm. him for the next game. There yep. are implications for what he did. And if you are there and you witness it, you can't just ignore it and say, oh, we don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
Now he got hauled out in handcuffs, so he's probably got what's coming to him. But we want to make sure in those situations that the kids don't get away with doing whatever they want. I don't know who brought that up, Dennis. That was that was good. Thanks. I should have had that good. ready. That was a yeah. that was a good bonus clip. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thanks for coming on, and I uh, appreciate you either taking the day off to visit or coming on right after your games. Um, but I'll be here next month. Let me pull up um, our schedule for the next meeting. It's going to be, again, the third Thursday, the third Thursday of February, February 16, 7 p.m. Central Time. We'll talk about coaches. That means, I hate to say conflict resolution because that the, the term is so overused, but conflict resolution with coaches. When they get out of control, when they yell and they scream, maybe they're just talking to you pleasantly and 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 you can handle it that way. Maybe they're look like they're talking pleasantly, but they're actually cursing you out. How do we handle coaches in, in difficult situations to help keep the game as smooth running as possible? That's at least that's the plan for now. De-escalation, Josh. De-escalation. De-escalation, yes. I mean, really, proactively, proactively making sure we don't get a technical foul because that's ultimately our goal, right? We want to avoid the technical foul. Doesn't mean we can all the time. Doesn't mean we should all the time. But most of the time, if we can avoid it by talking the coaches down and off the ledge, we're going to be better off. And you will be, for those guys that are trying to move up to the next level, you will be noticed for how you handle coaches. You're not noticed for the calls you make. You're noticed for the calls you don't make and for the things that you do to keep the coach under control when he starts to, to rise up. So hopefully you all can make it for that and that'll be useful. I actually... Little, the last time we did it handling coaches, I actually really liked how it turned out. So I'm hoping we'll have a similar, uh, similar experience. Appreciate it, Josh. Absolutely. Thanks, Absolutely. Thanks, Josh. Josh. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Josh. Take it easy, guys. Yes, yes, sir.